Yesterday, we started to explore the third foundation of mindfulness, contemplation of the state of mind, citta nupasana. We started out with taking a look how we usually look at the mind. Most people will assume that the mind seems to remain the same. But in the Buddha's teaching, the notion of a permanent mental organ is rejected. Yeah. The mind is regarded not as lasting subject of thought, feeling, volition, but always a sequence of momentary mental acts, distinct and discreet for each of them. Their connections with one another is causal. Yeah there's always some conditions that will cause you to feel a certain way. There's always some conditions to make you will a certain way, yeah, volition, make you want to do something. Yeah? Think about why do you, why do you have lunch? Yeah? Most people probably because they're hungry, Second, probably they want to enjoy the food. Yeah. So there are causal, there are causes, there are conditions that causes your volition to arise. The connections of all your mental activity, mental acts, are all conditions rather than substantial. What does substantial mean? Means that the thought appears for no reason. Huh? The mental act appears for no reason. It just appears on its own. Yeah? Can you can you think of anything like that? Huh? If you have any, we can explore whether it's truly substantial or is it also causes by conditions. Yeah? This is like the exercise of emptiness that Shifu gives. Yeah? If you recall, in the Heart Sutra workshop. Okay, let's move on to the next paragraph. A single act of consciousness is called a citta, which we shall render a state of mind. Its citta consists of many components. The chief of which is consciousness itself, the basic experiencing of the object. Consciousness is also called citta, the name for the whole being given to its principal part. Along with consciousness, every citta contains a set of concomitants called cetasikas, mental factors. These include feeling, perception, volition, the emotions, etc. In short, all the mental functions except the primary knowing of the object, which is citta or consciousness. A single act of consciousness, citta. One citta, each citta, can have many components, but the main one is, of course, consciousness itself. Yeah, how we experience the object, the basic experience of the object. Consciousness is also called citta. The name for the whole being given to its principal part. Yeah. How do we understand this line? Yeah. Does any of you get this line? The name for the whole 
being given to its principal part. I think it was referring to this line. A single act of consciousness is called a jitta, you know, the whole thing, a state of mind. This state, the whole state of mind, the chief component is consciousness itself. And then the chief component is being given the same name, chitta as well. The name for the whole, which is this thing, this is the whole, being given to its principal part, because its principal part is consciousness, is also named Chitta. Yeah? I think this is what is meant. Do you guys agree? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the confusion comes because both of them, both of them are named Chitta, but we have to distinguish them that one is the whole thing, chitta of the whole thing. This whole thing, the main whole thing, most of it are, the principal part is consciousness, a big chunk of it. And this is given the name chitta as well. Yeah. So this is what this line means, I think. Moving on, along with consciousness, every chitta contains a set of concomitants. Yeah, let's define concomitants here. Yeah, a phenomenon that naturally accompanies or follows something. Yeah, something like a uh, components. Concomitants. Yeah. Something that always accompanies something. Called jetasikas, the mental factors. Yeah, this is a, the set of the the state of mind itself. What are these mental factors? Feeling, perceptions, volitions, emotions, all the mental activities that you can think of. Yeah, all the mental functions, except, except the one that we covered before. The primary knowing of the object, which is chitta or consciousness. Any of you would like to add anything before we read the next paragraph? Yeah, perhaps after we read more, it will be, we will have more clarity. Let's continue reading. How about uh, Zhang Jie, would you like to read? Yeah. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, since consciousness in itself is just a bare experiencing of an object, it cannot be differentiated through its own nature, but only by way of its associated factors, the satasikas. The, is it, is that, the satasikas color the shita and give it its distinctive character. Thus, when we want to pinpoint the shita as an object of contemplation, we have to do so by using the Shetta Sikas as indicators. In his expositions of the contemplation of the state of mind, the Buddha mentions, by reference to Shetta Sikas, 16 kinds of Chitta can be noted. The mind with lust, the mind without lust, the mind with aversion, the mind without aversion, the mind with delusion, the mind without the illusion, the cramped mind, the scattered mind, the developed mind, the undeveloped mind, the surpassable mind, the unsurpassable mind, the concentrated mind, the unconcentrated mind, the freed mind, the unfreed mind. For practical purposes, it is sufficient at the start to focus solely on the first six, uh, six states, noting whether the mind is associated with any of the unwholesome roots or free from them. When a particular chitta is present, it is contemplated merely as a chitta, a state of mind. It is not identified with as I or mind, not taken as a self or as something belonging to a self. 
whether it is a pure state of mind or defiled state, a lofty state or a low one. There should be no elation or dejection, only a clear recognition of the state. The state is simply noted, then allowed to pass without clinging to the desired ones or resenting the undesired ones. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjay, for reading this long paragraph. Let's take a look and try to decipher de this zipper of this paragraph. Mm. We started off with consciousness. In itself, it's just a bare experiencing of an object. It cannot be differentiated through its own nature, but only by way of its associated factor, the jeta sikas. The jeta sikas color the chitta and give its distinctive character. Thus, when we want to pinpoint the chitta as object of contemplation, we do so by using the chetasikas, the mental factors as indicators. What are these indicators? 16 kinds of chitta. Let's take a look at the first six. First, the mind without, with lust, without lust, with aversion, without aversion, with delusion, without delusion. These six are recommended to begin with here. For practical purposes, it is sufficient to start firstly, focus on the first six states, noting whether the mind is associated, associated with any of the unwholesome roots or free from them. Yeah? The first six basically aversion, uh, last aversion, delusion. Yeah? And then if you multiply by two, Firstly, without all these three, and secondly, with all these three, then it becomes six in total. Whether the mind is associated, uh, when a particular chitta is present, this line, it is contemplated merely as a chitta state of mind, not identified with as I of mind not taken as a self or as something belonging to a self. Yeah, you have probably encountered this line many times and this has become the thematic contemplation. Yeah? Every time you contemplate something, don't identify it. Yeah? Try not to identify it with I, mine, me, self, yeah? as self or something belonging to a self. Even if it is a pure state of mind or a defined state of mind, a lofty state or a low one, there should be no elation, no dejection, only a clear recognition of the state. The state is simply noted, then allowed to pass without clinging to the desired ones. or resenting the undesired ones. I think quite a good paragraph. Any of you would like to add something? Yes. Also, would you be able to give an example to illustrate this? Ah, Let's well, say your example about hunger. Mm -hmm. So when your body notice like or uh, the stomach is growling then um then what are we supposed to think like you're not thinking or uh, or uh, hung uh growling means i am hungry or growling means uh i want to eat some food you know how how, how should you uh how, how to illustrate this paragraph with an example okay this is a good question thanks for the question for hunger they are Usually, there are two main motivations when hunger arises. Firstly, we want to eat to satisfy the hunger, yeah? which is 
completely fine, completely okay. Second, some of us, including me, I also eat because of the pleasure that the food gives. Yeah? I always choose a nice food, for example, fried rice or ramen, yeah? my, one of my favorite foods. When the thought arises, the second one arises, can see that is actually a mind with lust. Yeah? Here, lust is not just referring to the sexual lust, but any kinds of desire. When that thought arises, oh, I want to eat fried rice because it's so nice, it gives me pleasure. Then that is where I should know. That is a mind with lust. Yeah? Because I want to satisfy my own desire of having a fried rice. In the case that you don't have this thought, you just want to eat purely to alleviate your hunger. Then you can contemplate that I purely having this food just to maintain my body, just to remove my hunger. Then you can say, this is the mind without lust. Yeah. With regards to that example. Yeah. That's a very good question and very good uh, case study we can use on. Yeah. The trick with hunger is always tricky because usually it always involves two motivation. The first motivation is what the Buddha usually always recommends to focus on, just to remove your hunger. Don't take food as a pleasurable thing. But the tricky part is it's not so easy because <laughs> food by itself, it also directly having contact with our tongue, which can easily give rise to pleasure or pain yeah if the food is not <laughs> as good any any of you would like to share more examples probably probably not regards to food maybe other things thank you myself so can i clarify um the when the the first sentence right so uh since consciousness in itself is just bad experience so the hunger knowing the hunger is consciousness, is it? Knowing the hunger, since consciousness itself. <laughs> hmm. And, and when you say your 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 craving for things, then are those the the other associated factors? Like you know, I I I just yeah couldn't understand how to uh, interpret this yeah, with an example. Hmm, that's a good question. Let's see. Does any of you have answer to Singhui? For me, I think the consciousness, right, is when contact meets the object. Then it gives rise to that consciousness. So we have six main consciousness, right? If we see things, if we hear things, so there's sight, there is uh, sound, there is uh, smell, there's taste, there's body, and there's also the mind. So when you say the growling, you know, it's a form of feeling. Probably it maybe is uh, the touch or the body sensation that uh, have that growling. And maybe you hear the sound, it's a sound. So when this happens, and then very quickly your mind, uh, your this, the sixth consciousness will start to have thoughts, thoughts arising. So actually, when all this happens, you are just supposed to see it as it is. That means when there's a growling sound to start with, or your stomach start, started to, you know, uh, churn, churn, that kind of thing. So you, you, your mind actually notice the body reaction to that feeling, you know, and then you also can start realizing that your mind will react to this 
uh, contact. That means whether it's a sound of the hunger or the growling of the hunger, straight away your mind will come up with, oh, I'm hungry. You know that kind of thing? So your mind can actually uh, start to have like what Marcel say, the last, the, the one thing to eat good food kind of thing. Or your mind can just think that, oh, I'm hungry, I need to eat, you know? And then if let's say, there's no food available, you can observe that your mind will have this aversion, like angry with how come um, the, somebody is supposed to prepare the food for you, the lunch, and it's not there, you know, or you're not ang angry even if you see no food around. But the part with delusion and no delusion, I think it's a, a bit difficult for me to, to mm -hmm. contemplate whether you have delusion or your mind didn't have delusion. Yeah. So I think the easier part to start with probably is just observe whatever the first five or even the sixth sense, whenever there's an object that arises that the, the consciousness gets and see or hear or smell, you know, then the mind just go. So you're supposed to when contemplate the mind, just look at it. Just look at that state. Don't think whether it's desirable, not desirable. I, I think I mean that is my understanding of what this uh contemplation of the mental factors of the mind is talking about. Because you're supposed to guan sing wu chang. The first so the first is the body, right? Then after that, the feeling. So actually this feeling is quite similar to the later on the consciousness uh, uh, come in. But this feeling is actually the very initial uh, state of when the I see something that the contact and the conscious, uh, the feeling arises. So when this sight means you see something, you know, so this is the second part that's talking about. After you see that something, your, your mind, your consciousness will start <laughs> reacting to it. Yeah, so we are supposed to, after Guan Sen Fu Jing, Guan Sou Si Ku, Guan Xing Wu Chang, so we are supposed to later on contemplate and know that everything is impermanent. So we are just, just, you know, whenever contact feeling arise, then all your perception, your your volition, your everything will follow. So this is the part of the consciousness. Actually, it's quite complex. It's a multiple, you know, from perception to to thoughts to to your consciousness. Yeah, this this whole part about the mind. Uh, that that's my interpretation. I don't know whether it's correct or not. <laughs> Okay, thanks again for adding on. Uh, uh, thanks simply for the question. Maybe we can you know, start to, uh, after this session, maybe we can do our homework and read more and see whether we can find satisfactory answer to your question. Yeah. Either from this material or from our <laughs> main reference, the 300 pages thesis. Yeah. After we read, more than we can see and find out. Yeah. But thanks for the question. Uh, good question and thanks again for helping to answer. Any of you would like to add anything before we wrap up for this morning? If not, let's do a dedication. Yen Xiao San Zhang Zhu Fan now. Amitophon. We meet again. May we be guided by the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a restful Sunday. Okay. Thanks everyone for participating. Good to see everyone. See Thank you guys you. next time. Bye bye. bye.